never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around. Hi, folks. Welcome back to Neff Inspiration, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today is another fantastic day for an interview, and I'm honored to have Kelly Killingsworth with me. Um, Kelly has an amazing story of transformation, and it's really from the brink to the boardroom. Uh, and I love to hear that because uh, it just shows that we all go through a lot of shit in our life and, and we often get it a bit wrong in the way we deal with the negative emotions. And that's just cool uh, because if we then use our experience and let it transform us and let it, let it push us into the right direction, there is an energy there uh, where, we, where we strive to get into the light because we have seen so much darkness. Hell, it is, it's no longer funny. And therefore, so I think we've got here two P's uh, of a part here. I can't wait to talk to Kelly. Welcome to my show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, very grateful to be here. Oh, cool. Oh, man. Uh, it is uh, knowing your story. Uh, it, it started actually quite early, isn't it? Um, it is um, from the word go, you had yet not the nicest setting in life. Tell us a little bit about that. Growing up at a young age, um, I, I grew up in a really troubled, troubled home. My parents would fight often and they split at a young age. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I would get food boxes. We would get food boxes from the state and that's how we ate, drinking milk from cans and whatnot like that. I remember an old wrecked trailer. That's what we lived in. It would leak in the winter and there would be mice jumping everywhere. So that was at a young age. Shortly after that, around eight years old, my dad became sober. He changed his life and he changed mine and my sister's stars. So after that, our life became exponentially better. But uh, I, I, for some reason, chose a similar path to what I knew when I was young. And um, I'm sure we'll get to that. <laughs> oh, it's hard, isn't it? On the one hand, you have got the children of uh, alcoholics. I mean, we we are we are pretty much uh, you. There are certain features that we just get ingrained at an early stage. You never know um, how mom and dad will be like. So you're always you you develop a heightened level of awareness and situational awareness or PTSD. I mean, wherever the, the line swings, does that ring a bell with you? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes, PTSD. Uh, I have that. Uh, I work on it now mm -hmm. daily. Mm -hmm. Brett, dating back to that time, uh, to sort of more more children's times, because your life was was quite chaotic later on as well. So did, did the early, early years, despite the fact that your dad did a magic turnaround, did they leave their mark as far as you can tell? Oh, yes, they left their mark. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of memories that I still have that I technically, you know, wish I wouldn't have. But I'm at the same time, I'm very grateful that I have them. So mm -hmm. I know what not to do um, now. And when it comes to your and own kids. Oh, and yeah and i know and i have my own kids now and i i know i i know what a healthy relationship is now because i built one and um and i'm i'm just so grateful that i got out of the space that i did mm -hmm. and my dad made the decisions that he did to get my me and my sister out uh a big shout out to your dad uh, he's already my hero, regardless what happened in the first eight years. Um, yeah. So I uh, call. Cool. Okay. Um, so here we are with your dad. Uh, did your mom also have a, a relationship with substances and with alcohol? So my mother, yes. She, she, I'm not sure if she still has problems with substance and alcohol. Mm. So it was an ongoing thing with her. There was multiple times when I was a kid, my, my mother never came to any of my football games or, and that was my sport. That's where I felt like a unity. I felt like I could be myself. I could let my emotions out. And, um, but, and I would always want her to be there, but she was never there. 
Uh, so that took a really big toll on me and it, it still does today. If I miss my kids games, it hurts me so much. If I have to miss the games, I know my kids, I, I tell them if I have to be out of town or I'm working and I talk to them and they understand, but, and it doesn't really hurt them because I make every game I can, but it hurts me still because I know the feeling of wanting your parent to be there and they're not there. Um, we had when I was living with my mother before my dad got became full custodian. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was times when uh, police would come to the house, and I would see I seen my mom throw this golf ball size white baggy in the trash. And I, at the time, I was like, I didn't know what it was. I just thought, okay, it's normal, whatever. But now, <laughs> the road that I've been through and what I know now Hmm. I know what it really was and uh it just wasn't a healthy place to be Hmm. um and so but I'm grateful that I went through it though because I know Hmm. I know what the bottom looks like I know what the trenches look like and I know I don't want to be there Hmm. but of course having that upbringing and having uh, the set of parents also means that there's probably a genetic predisposition there. Uh, there are some genes that are maybe a little bit more likely to set you up to go down a similar path. Having said that, I mean, these genes, whilst they are there, it all depends upon then what we do. Because many children of alcoholics, because they have seen such a bad, bad time, um, they choose very consciously not to go down that route. No, I will not drink. No, I will not use. Having said that, I mean, there are many other ways of being addicted. And <laughs> so let it be sugar, sex, shopping, uh, social media, etc. So only because you don't pick up one vice uh, doesn't mean to say that that you're not going out there and just uh, ticking the boxes in all the others. Okay, so let's... Do you think you've got an addictive personality? I have a very addictive personality. <laughs> I, I know so. I don't think so. I know so. When I do things... <laughs> When I do things, I love to do them all in, <laughs> head first, feet first. I dive in and I go big, and so that's and I know that now. So, welcome to my world, brother. <laughs> yeah, right. I love it. <laughs> okay, so okay, so basically, we've we've laid down the foundation there, and then, uh, yeah, okay. So things for what five years, seven years, things worked out quite nicely. But what happened then? What was the allure of you going from football to maybe not so nice coping mechanism? It was in high school and I started drinking at the age of 15. Mm -hmm. And the the only time that I wanted to drink was during my football season. Uh, That was important to me. Every other time um, throughout the year, I would drink before school. Um, I would drink at lunch. Interesting. Um, I would definitely drink every week, uh, multiple days. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I got caught at school by a teacher one time that I went to the wrong English class and I took a test with that class and the teacher called me in afterward and they knew that I had been drinking and they said, if I ever do it again, that I'm going to be in trouble. So I just never got caught again. <laughs> how was your test? How did you how did you score? Uh, I don't even know. I think I got <laughs> up and walked out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, oh dear. Uh, but why? What uh, I understand that we use alcohol to come out of our shell, that we deal with our negative emotions because we want to escape our reality. So that's all cool, but that typically happens or happened in me more in the evening um whilst in the morning um, certainly in, in, in my early stages, I would never drink. Why, why in the morning? What did the alcohol give you? A sense of maybe, maybe it was confidence. You know, I just, I seen a lot in my past and there was a lot that I was hiding from and, mm-hmm. and I was a very emotional um, kid. Uh, mm. I mean, I still am. I have a big heart. Um, 
but mm -hmm. it would hide those feelings either that or it would make the feelings okay in a way it would it would make it okay to feel to to be able to cry and it would be okay because no. uh, my mind was thinking you know that I feel better doing it because I'm a little bit drunk and and I oh, you know yeah. I don't I'm not I'm not real real sure why why I drink mm -hmm. so much is a mm -hmm. is a really good question and uh I I didn't have a care I didn't care I didn't I didn't care about my relationships um at all whether it be with my teachers uh my parents my me myself I mean I just I really didn't care I didn't care about my body mm. And uh, so it was kind of like, oh, well, why not drink? Because mm -hmm. exactly. I don't really care about anything. <laughs> But that's that's another typical uh, typical feature of a, a child uh, from a very chaotic um, circumstance. Uh, you only look after yourself. You become quite narcissistic. You become quite focused on yourself. The only thing that matters is your own survival. And often enough, if there is pain, And you have got that substance that actually takes that pain away or, or just at least makes things a bit more bearable. Why wouldn't you use it? Especially in your young mind where you where you think, hey, yeah, um, you know, oh, that feels good. Let me do it. Um, right. And it, it felt good. And it also made me kind of feel accepted. Exactly. Um, exactly right. And, and so of I course, that guy. did you surround yourself with people who were drinking a lot? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, of course. And then I was the guy that was uh that would have the parties at the house and would have a full house of people in. So I was yeah, exactly. that guy. I was like the cool guy and I had a lot of friends. Exactly. But they probably weren't the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yep. <laughs> I had a very social life there as well. <laughs> I had a bar in my little student room. Uh, and the, the room was, oh, God, you couldn't swing a cat, man. Um, but it had a bed, it had a, a, a desk, and then it had a big bar that I built. And that was very nicely stocked, thank you very much. Um, so <laughs> I always made sure I had everything ready kind of a thing. So... Whilst I nowadays pride myself on disaster preparedness, etc., that unfortunately I was too prepared as far as the the alcohol was concerned. Uh, I have to, to admit that. Oh goodness! Um, did you graduate? Uh, did you did you make it through college? I graduated high school. I don't really know how I oh. graduated <laughs> from high school, but I did. I did. Good I made idea. it through. I didn't go to college. I I partied until I was <laughs> 20, 23 years old. And 23 years old, I was selling drugs. I was using drugs. I was drinking. My life wasn't going anywhere. I was uh, overweight and just really had nothing. I was just living the day to day. I had nothing big going for me. I came to a realization like I needed to change. I want a better life. And someday I want to have a family. Mm. So at the age of 23, I, <laughs> I joined the military. I joined the army and I, I went in January 2nd of 2003. No, sorry. Yes. 2003. No, 2012. I went in 2012. I graduated high school 2003. I went in the army to 2007. Mm. And I went in, ironically, January 2nd was my first day of boot camp. So my flight and everything to go into the military, I was severely hung over. I betcha. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Why did you choose the military? structure hmm. structure and i and looking back now i i do really well when i have a coach i have hmm. somebody uh hmm. leading me there's somebody giving me steps to take to get the mission done i mean i i loved the military i was in when i first went in i was gung-ho and i was going to be in there for life um 
but it didn't turn out so much like that. Hmm. What was your military specialty? I was a 35 Mike, which is a human intelligence collector. Interesting. I, yeah, yeah, right. And I never thought communication uh, was really that important until just recently, but that was like my job then. I <clears throat> I only did two interrogations while in Iraq. I was in Iraq from 08 to 09. And the, the rest of the time I ran source operations, which was really, really cool. Um, I, I would get information from my sources. I would write the report on the information. And then I would go out with the Cav Scouts and we would go out and, and we would find the IED or we would find the weapons cache that cool. I got the information on, that I reported on. Cool. And and we would go take care of it. So that was just some of the most gratifying work. I was actually saving lives. Yeah. It you doesn't know. surprise me whatsoever that that you went into that because you were brought up instinctively with a heightened level of awareness situational awareness you can read a room in a fraction of a second you can read that face the micro expressions in 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 just you know the, the, probably better than many others no surprise that that you had an innate ability to to sniff out bullshit um and sniff out stories ha ha okay that's now that's intriguing that that your life took this turn there Okay, wow. Okay, so there was a career essentially waiting for you. Um, and you, you you nailed it there. Here you are directly there. You are saving lives. You are you are the man. Um, and that of course lifts your 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 standing. Um having said that, you came from a world of drugs and alcohol and escaping reality to now extreme ownership and holding yourself accountable now that was not an easy transformation uh no. how the hell did you survive that no it, it wasn't an easy transition and the alcohol never really left after after basic training uh, we could go out on at the local places and, and bring alcohol back uh -huh. so the alcohol was still part of my yeah. life through my military career mm. definitely so that but the drugs weren't um so cool even even in iraq where they have a dry uh it, you can't get any alcohol there supposedly well i had sources that knew how to get alcohol and i would have them bring it on to the base <laughs> for me so uh, yeah as an intelligence everything. i was about to say as an intelligence yeah. specialist come on fuck's sake yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so, yeah exactly and uh, there's and that is always the the fact uh but obviously you were um and that can be a benefit i mean obviously you you were making friends amongst your own your own group of people uh because you wouldn't have drunk alone you would have actually uh you would have been again the cool dude um that people want to be around with so it's a very predictable what you're telling me there um so and that's cool but i mean here you were i mean um you enjoyed your life um, it would have been quite addictive just to actually have that level of success, that level of hard work leading directly to tangible results. I mean, that's intoxicating where I come from. Um, so why did that stop? When I got back from being deployed, when I was deployed, I went through some very hard depression as well. And when I got back from being deployed, uh, it never really went away. And so I really, really used alcohol a lot Scheiße. Yeah. after I got back. And so <clears throat> when I got out of the military um, <laughs> and moved back home, it just, alcohol never really left. And then alcohol mm -hmm. started to lead to other substances. And then when I would have alcohol, then I would have the other substance. Mm -hmm. And, and it just kind of went hand in hand. And it, and again, it just hit everything. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm 
probably really lucky to be alive at this point. And it's so easy because you've had, uh, in your younger years, you used, and there is a, there's a saying or a perception that the moment you start drinking and using as a young man, that's where your emotional maturity stops. So often enough, we talk about a 40, 50 year old man with the emotional maturity of a 12 year old or 15 year old. And while that is probably a crossover simplification, there is some some nugget of truth there. Um, because we don't as, as alcoholics and, and as as people running away, escaping our reality, we don't deal with our emotions. The last thing you want to feel is an emotion, certainly not the negative ones. So that's why you drink. Um, which substances were interesting to you? Was it uppers, downers? Was it? Um, yeah. So I, I had a spurt of two years when I was addicted to methamphetamine. Ouch. And yeah, that was a tough one. Uh -huh. um, I quit that cold turkey though. Uh, I'm, Why? And that's another thing that I just, because I was, I, man, I wasn't doing the right things. I wasn't making the right choices. Uh -huh. I, I just... I got so far down into in the trenches, like it was just like, what am I doing? And oh. and I would be there. I re would realize it for a while, and it it just once you're there for a while, and you just kept beating myself up about it. I just had to. I just changed wow. that. I what and I thought I was going to do it, you know, for the better. But I always seemed to go back down the rabbit hole. Uh, after methamphetamine, uh, I would obviously still drink. Mm. And then it became cocaine. And cocaine and alcohol are just, uh, it just goes together too well. <laughs> so It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it See, does. I, I, did, it, I didn't know, any, I didn't need any drugs because the alcohol gave me that. The alcohol gave me that second wind. So I would, would be working 12, 16 hours and then I'm I'm tired and have two, three, four glasses of wine and suddenly, bing, I'm awake again. Give it to me. So I had this yeah. natural response. So I didn't need the uppers, um, which is maybe just as well for crying out loud. Um, so I, uh, drugs <laughs> never never really made it into my life, but I can see because I, I, I use the drug, uh, the, the alcohol, for exactly the same purpose. Um, here you go. Okay, cool, man. Far out. I mean, but interestingly, you had this dad who turned his life around when you were eight. Did you drift apart or did he try to be part of the journey? Did he try to pull you back? Was he trying to be your wingman and, and looking out for you? Definitely. This is a pretty good one, too. So growing up, my dad would always tell me you're, that I'm hanging out with the wrong friends, that uh, my friends are going nowhere mm. and I'm going to end up going nowhere with them. And he, you know, I would come home drunk. He would know. I'll talk to me a lot about how I need to change and I, I should do better and what he does and what has helped him. So he was there. I just Brilliant. never accepted it. Uh, I never accepted it. I never listened to him. I never wanted to listen to what my parent had to say. <laughs> I, I knew everything and they didn't know shit. Well, <laughs> I mean, he went down, I'm going down the same path that he went down. So of course he knew. Um, and just, uh, three years ago, I was three years ago. I, I became clean and sober. And for the last time, I'm never going back. I know that for, for sure now, but, but just two years ago or so I called my dad and I told him that, I apologize for never listening to him, that he was right. Uh -huh. And I, I should have listened to him earlier, but I'm listening to him now. And I thanked him and told him I'm very grateful for everything that you tried to do for me. I realized what you were trying to do now. And, uh, and, and since that point, me and my dad have become really close. Oh, how beautiful is that? I'm so pleased for you um, because it's so hard for your dad um, to see you suffering. He saw you yeah. for who you were, uh, not the addict, but the son who is in trouble. 
and um, and he knew that trouble intimately uh so it would have been hell purgatory for him um to see you yes. like that because he knew exactly what you were going through oh, i'm so pleased i'm so pleased this must have been one of the most beautiful times in his life when that phone call occurred yeah wow what made you turn around what made you change after all you had now years and uh, you, you were you were a professional you were decades of running away from your emotions why the hell would you stop now come on <laughs> well uh, so I, three years ago i i was in a very toxic relationship and uh and i'm i would take responsibility for it i wasn't making the right decisions and i came to a point where i had to split up with i made the decision to split up with my girlfriend at the time and we have two children together mm -hmm. so that ensued a three-year custody battle and the first year mm -hmm. i still didn't make i wasn't making the right decisions for the right reasons I, I still had my tendencies. Um, I wasn't drinking as much, but I was using. And I started drinking again. And then it was Thanksgiving time in 2021, I think it was. And I got arrested. And that was a bad time. I, uh, I don't really remember, but I was calling the cop names and i wouldn't get in the cop car and they had to force me in and um mm -hmm. i i came out of and and i mind you i am used to being in the back of cop cars i've <laughs> been arrested over <laughs> over 10 times uh you know so it's not oh, like i'm like yeah whatever so <clears throat> getting out i just i realized i'm going to lose everything I am going to lose the house that I bought. Yeah. I, I own a three bedroom, two bath house. I, I was going to lose that. I was going to lose more importantly, my two children. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I just, it was a, I had the children, my children, losing my children mm. was the scariest part of that and that is why i i looked at my child i didn't look at them i told myself that i promised my children mm. that i am going to change my life and i'm not going to drink and i'm not going to use anymore and ironically my father he has told me that when he became sober he promised us kids that he would never drink again so i did that with my kids and i'm not going to drink again uh, that yeah that was scary and i and and it would seem like every time that i was doing good in life is when i would be like okay well now i'm gonna go have a drink uh, 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 uh. but you need to and celebrate right, it's right that. you need to celebrate <laughs> And it's just like it opens up this rabbit hole that oh, is yeah. so fast to go back down. And now being down that road a few times, I know what not to do. And so I know I'm not going to do that anymore. I just, it just isn't worth it to me. Hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful, 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 man. Um, this is it, oh, man. And having said all that, it is an incredibly powerful thing that you did there, but we need to talk about how to live life now. Because here you were, like me, trying to escape reality, trying to run away from your negative emotions. I mean, I ended up in, in rehab uh, for a month, and that was the best experience ever. The worst, of course, and the best. Right, right. <laughs> Hugely challenging and uh, transforming. Um, but it is, it gave me that protected bubble, uh, where I could actually explore all the resentment, the shame, the anger, the guilt, um, all those beautiful things that you were running a mile from, um, prior, even, you know, the week before you went, I went into rehab. 
Um, and now suddenly I had to feel those emotions. I had to, to work through the reasons that I was drinking. I was a uh, hard school of Knox. That was uh, wow. Um, how did that happen with you? I mean, it's one thing to just say, okay, I'll stop now. And these are the white, no. uh, white I call them white necklace. <sighs> yeah. I'm, I'm sitting in yeah. a meeting. I'm fine. I don't need to go. Right. No, no, I'm, I don't need to drink, really, not at all. Uh, yeah. It's now 50 to 25 years, I think. I can't remember. Right? I do two meetings a day because that's the only fucking way that they can survive. And it's not a, that's not even surviving. Um, right. You and I live different lives now, but how did you get there? It was tough. That was the pivotal moment was when I had to look at myself in the mirror. Then there was years where I did not, I wouldn't look at myself in the mirror and I'm tall enough. I'm six foot four. So I, when I brush my teeth, I can like stand above my mirror. So I don't really have to look at myself. So, <laughs> so and I, I literally, I literally, I wouldn't look at myself in the uh, mirror. And so what I started to do was sit in front of the mirror and not look away. I would look at myself and it was hard because there's a lot of decisions. There's a lot of things that I blamed myself for that I had to come to realization that not everything was my fault and everything that was my fault, I need to be okay with because I'm changing my life and I'm going to do better now. And and there was, there's a lot, because when you're drinking and you're using, there's a lot of lives that you affect that you don't know that you affected, right? So, so facing that, facing myself in the mirror, facing those objectives, uh, it was tough. It was probably one of the hardest things I had to do. It, it wasn't easy. Uh, there was times when I would leave I think I thought I was leaving. I'd go to the front door to leave. I'd have my hand on the doorknob and I would sit there and I'd just be like, why am I leaving? And it would be to go get a drink. <laughs> and so I would have to turn around and go lay down on the bed and cry myself to just whatever I would. Huh. I, it just wasn't a good time, but I'm glad I did it. Um, but and who helped look you? At myself. Absolutely, and, and that is so important. But I mean, at the moment, you're, it seems like you're doing it alone, um, which yeah. is one of the hardest things and probably the least likely to succeed uh, of all the approaches of, uh, to, of becoming sober and trying to live your life to the fullest because you've got these powerful memories and these powerful habits from the past constantly saying, what the hell are you doing? Why are you in this much pain? Uh, you come on, I, I've got the solution here. Come on, it's just one snort. It's just one drink or five or 10 or 20. Right. Yeah. Uh, but these, these voices are there. So, so who guided you or how the hell did you find sanity in this turmoil of voices who want to track you back. My, my father, my father, and he's the one that told me to be the clock in the windstorm. Uh, and especially when I got sober, there was a few times I almost didn't stay sober. I, my, um, I've had to go back to court three separate times because the mother of the, my children wanted to take full custody of the children. And I have prevailed every time, thankfully. So those were, those are just really tough times, but he told me to be the clock in the windstorm. So if you can imagine a, a windstorm chaos is going on around me and I'm a clock, I'm sitting there steady, steady, steady ticking, always forward, mm. never back, nice. steady ticking, always forward. So I took that and that's one of my core values that I have now is, is the nice. resiliency nice. is be a clock in the windstorm, steady ticking, always forward. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. It only matters what you're doing to move yourself forward. Nice. Nice. I haven't heard it dis uh, described as such, but that is, that is exactly how I live my life. 
those mm-hmm. small consistent steps uh creating habits that uh that that allow you or even sometimes force you to go forward and to go into the direction that you have determined is better than where you have gone in the past beautiful beautiful and there is so much chaos going on in all of our lives and most of us have not learned these lessons we most of us are reactive we are like a cork bobbing on the top of a very uh stormy ocean and without any rudder without any thoughts we're just reacting to whatever just floats by um how did you develop this awareness how did you which which habits did you implement that proved finally working for you uh changing my inner circle was a huge one and it was and it was tough it was so lonely for a while uh i live in a small town everybody knows everybody uh so (laughs) and everybody does the same thing it seems like and so when i when i did that when i cut people out of my life that were continuing doing these things that i didn't want to do anymore it became really lonely and my friends list became less than three (laughs) so (laughs) so it was it was tough and it was lonely but at the same time it's a transition that i feel like i if i didn't go through that then i wouldn't be where i am today because it forced me to really it's like, well, I want to have companions, so I got to find the right ones. I never thought Humboldt County, where I'm at, there were the right people to hang around with, but there are those people. It's just you have to change your mindset. I had to change my mindset and um, to find the right people I wanted to emulate and be like. And once I did that, then mm-hmm. I, I now have another inner circle, and all of the people are very motivating and and very hopeful and any questions that come up with my business or anything Mm -hmm. like that. It's just my mentors and uh, yeah, that's been my guide. Mm -hmm. And that's, was a hard thing to do. It sucks being lonely. It sucks being that lonely. Because of course, loneliness has been also a describing uh, fixture of your childhood. Um, yeah. So you were seeking, you were wanting to be the people pleaser, you were wanting to be accepted by others, shown love, the external validation, the external, oh, utter boy, good man, uh, all that. Yeah. Oh, boy, that's a hard, hard, hard journey. But there, it is said that if you surround yourself with six millionaires, then it's very hard for you not to become a millionaire. And if you're with uh, together with six creatives, uh, it's again, you will find the, the creative streak within you. And if you surround yourself with six idiots, uh, yeah, you're going to be that. the seven. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so I think that is where our choices have so many implications, so many uh, flow on effects. Oh, boy. <laughs> so your business what do you do what what how i mean you were at the brink um how the hell did you pull yourself back from the brink uh from being virtually homeless for virtually you know knee deep in shit to suddenly building a uh, a business now that how the hell do you do that because that is the structure of so many people out there I had to dig deep. I had to dig real deep and figure out what I really wanted. And and this is where probably my addictive personality might have helped me, but I took my past and what I know and what I, what I know how to do very well. And that's be, being an operator and a truck driver. And I could, I could do those very well. So I started my own business. I went and took my license test and I have, I have my general engineering license, which is the hardest license to get in California. And, and that, that was huge for me. And technically I could build bridges. 
do I know how to build a bridge? Not yet, <laughs> but <laughs> technically I can. So <clears throat> I had to dig deep and, and I studied and I used what I knew um, and I used it for the good. Yeah. And then that's where I am now. I own an excavation company, Kelly and company, uh, which stands for Kelco construction LLC. And we, you know, we are in the dirt world. And without you, there is not much development going on. And there's certainly you want people like you there um, who can uh, figure out why that bloody pipe somewhere down there is broken. And that's not break right. 15 others in a path to it. <laughs> no, Shit. no, it does happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't you don't appreciate the skills of a man until you see him operating a heavy machinery. And he, he bloody hell. I mean, as I've seen dudes do thing where you think, oh my God, wow. Okay, that's right. a skill. And it is it it just shows that we all all have got uh, abilities that we can foster that we can bring up, but they don't just typically come on a silver tablet here. Go, 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 you go, boy. Oh. This is you are already better than Superman in that. Now, fuck all. Now it is no. you have to work hard and put a nose to the grindstone. I think yeah, what I what I picked up though is that you have got actually quite a strong work ethic, um, despite all the the maybe factors that were working against you. Uh, where did this work ethic come from? Great question. Uh, when I was growing up, every summer I would go work for my grandfather, uh -huh. and he owned a dairy ranch, so I would. <clears throat> That's where I learned all my work ethic. Uh, he taught me how to work, how to work hard, how to work smarter, not harder. Hmm. Uh, that probably took a while to teach me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, there was, uh, I would work for him every summer. I, he would drive the truck and I would have to um, load the hay bales onto the wagon from the ground. And I would load the whole wagon from the ground and he, <laughs> and it would only be me and him. So, uh, so that's where I learned a lot of my work ethic and I, uh, drinking took so much emotion. I, I allowed it to take so much emotion away from me that mm. I didn't realize what I had until, until it was gone. You know, he passed away and, and I look back now and I, I, and I still look up and I, I look up and I say, you know, I hope you're proud of me. Uh, and it means a lot to me now so mm. beautiful 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 it is and it's again I'm, I'm not sure how much that i guess i guess it is equally a, a predictable outcome i have of having a chaotic chaotic childhood a you want to control as much as possible um the 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 surrounding if you're not trying to escape you want to control things um so therefore you work hard because you from the word go i wanted to have three four different exits for every situation um i because life was so unpredictable you try to be prepared for everything kind of a thing yeah. and I, I there's nothing wrong with that i mean that is that is one of the most beautiful outcomes of PTSD or of trauma that you have got a race situational awareness and that you are no longer blinkered, that you know that violence is part of life, that death and destruction is part of life. So therefore you prepare for it. Um, and if you get the balance right between too much and paranoia versus ah, life is so beautiful. Yeah, right. <laughs> get the balance right. And that makes you a very valuable member of a team so i think i can see where it comes from and i i always say i was a workaholic long before i became an alcoholic um so <laughs> as we started the discussion you were saying yeah i'm 100 in 100 percent. that's too little 120 percent in <laughs> yeah, right so yeah how many how many hours a day do you work nowadays uh it's constant <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. constant it's so, con well right now too because i'm i own my own business so i have exactly. to wear like a lot of the hats of course you know and so so but <laughs> what i figured out is it it's just being able to manage it exactly 
<laughs> and, and, yeah. and it takes a lot. Yep. Oh, it's this, it, 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 it's called the disease of self-employment. Uh, so yes, we need to manage right. the symptoms really, really well, because it's the same yeah. with me. Um, but nowadays I live my, I live a different balance. So what works for you? How do you get the joy? How do you get the, the relaxation? So how can you switch off? What would you tell others who find themselves in a similar situation? You, what works for me is I had to find, I had to find some me time and, oh. and I had to schedule it into my calendar. Beautiful. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And whether it be the gym or now I, now I cycle. So mm -hmm. I've been, I've been doing that. And that's kind of like my alone time, my me time. I gather my thoughts. I can relax a little bit or I'll go outside and I'll have a stogie, a nice cigar, you know, and, and, and just kind of sit and reflect nice. on what everything, everything that's got me to this point now. Cause, uh, cause I never want to forget it, but nice. I don't want to dwell on it. I want to uh, learn from it. So nice. Nice, 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 nice. Well, exactly. It's those moments that are so precious uh, when you can actually stop and feel and then let these thoughts enter your brain or let your brain come up with the thoughts because I think yeah. our brain knows solutions to our problems and we just keep ourselves so busy and we have never learned to listen to our brain, to our gut instinct, to our, you know, um, what drives us and what actually wants us to succeed. The problem is you have got many, many voices in your head. So some of them are really good, but here you are coming from the wrong side of the tracks, having lived such a life. How is your imposter syndrome going? Yeah, man, there's a lot of times when I was, and it still happens, where a doubt comes into my head. And I'm like, what am I doing? Am I really this person? Am I really owning my business? Yeah. Am I making the right choices? And, uh, and that's where your inner circle comes in. If you build your inner <laughs> nice. circle, nice, yeah, nice. If you build your inner circle the correct way, how you really want it, and you surround yourself with people that you want to be like, you can call on your inner circle when these thoughts come into your mind, nice. and they will help you pull you pull you through it. Nice, and, and that's huge. That's been huge for me. Oh, what a beautiful answer to that question. Um, because that's so true. That's the first time that someone actually said that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's essentially the, the kind of mentoring system and, um, the, the, the kind of uh, 12 step system where often enough people through the 12 step, uh, process, um, find someone with whom they can gel and that specifically helps them for sobriety. But in your car, in your circumstance, we are talking about a business mentor. And that's so beautiful. Um, you are not the kind of, oh, I know it all. I know exactly what to do. Bullshit. Um, and I think that is the, the key thing. If we can all create power teams, but you have to make, well, if you create your power team, make sure you're the dumbest person in that team. Okay. So yeah. therefore, <laughs> you will be pulled up regardless what influences there come. It's no good that you're the leader all the time. Uh, you know, oh. there was a saying, sometimes oh. you, you win, sometimes you learn. Um, so <laughs> I want to learn. I want to learn, for fuck's sake, every single day and want to grow. Right. <laughs> and, right. And when you get that circle and you grow and, and you get to a point where you're going to surpass or you want to you want to grow more you look out for for other people that are now a, ahead of you living their best life exactly. and and you want to do the same thing and befriend them and and uh live a life that they're living and you'll get to that next point mm -hmm. that's what i'm doing now I'm, i really can't wait to get to the next point <laughs> but you also help others uh i mean you are you are yourself now starting to give back to society and that's again that's sort of a logical thing for us to do because we've gone through so much shit in our life and you think come on there must be a meaning to that 
typically we don't spell it out like that, but it's sort of sooner or later you actually start talking about your journey because you think, come on, I've gone for so much shit. Let's teach others and not teach in a condescending way, but share share the, the lessons I had to learn the hard way, I guess. Um, and that's that's the journey that you have started now. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's given the, the hope, giving people the hope that they can become resilient in their mm. transformation. Mm. That that being in the trenches. When I was in the trenches, I thought that was the end of the road for me. I wasn't mm. getting out. That's just how life was. But that's not the answer. It doesn't have to be that way. And it, it's hard. Mm. It's not easy. But I know and and people say this all the time. If I could do it, you could do it. But believe me, I was I was there. <laughs> I almost lost everything. I yeah. uh you can come out of it. It's your mindset. I had to change everything about me. Mm. And I had to be okay with my past and I had to face my past. Oh. And now I can move forward. Wow. Nothing but that is a beautiful thing. It is. Uh, we need to to pull the band aid off first. I need to look at the wound and the wounds, shall I say, because trauma comes in layers and healing comes in layers. And step backs will come. There's no two ways around it. But those of you who are early in recovery, listening now and thinking, well, they, the two of them got their shit together. Rest assured, we had our our lapses and our relapses. In the first year, it's 80% chance that you have a relapse, um, which means not just one drink, but actually falling full power back into your old life. And you you said it yourself, Kelly, over the years, you had repeated times where you got your shit together and then... Bam. <laughs> multiple times exactly multiple times and re even recently it's there's been times where i've been thinking about going back down that same road but mm. but now i have the tools with me to get past that situation mm. so in those situations everybody I, that i talk to all my mentors that are way more su successful than me they have very similar problems than what I have and what I had back then. Nice. It's all about how we react and we take care of that problem. And yeah. it's all mindset. Halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. H-A-L-T, halt. These are the four triggers for me that I can create a relapse if I wanted to. I just need to tick positive in all of those four domains, so to speak. And I will uh, be thinking about not very healthy ways of alleviating that suffering. And it's really good because nowadays, if I've got the feeling that, hey, I could do with a drink or oh, let me eat a whole cheesecake or, you know, whatever it is, um, I have to say, okay, what's going on here? I, I see it as a message from my body. Have I given myself the right nutrition? Chances are nobody know. Um, maybe I have, uh, you know, eaten too many empty calories, despite the fact that I nowadays really, really look after my nutrition. Um, there are still days when when things don't work out so well. And yeah, okay, so is that playing a role? Um, am I thirsty, hungry and thirsty? I put together in the same thing, um, as in, am I rehydrated? Or am I actually try like a crisp? Angry, well, yeah, I'm a hothead, okay, fair call. <laughs> I can manage that yeah. better nowadays, <laughs> but... <laughs> Definitely, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and shit happens. People don't pay you time. your invoices. Um, your your uh, your supplier doesn't get you the shit that you need. Uh, you get pressure from from the people on the ground as if why why are you not finished with that job? We're waiting to put the foundations down, and you, you just think, oh, for fuck's sake, yeah, hungry, angry, lonely, because sometimes, especially 
see, you put yourself into that situation being self uh, self employed. Um, so yeah. you are lonely. There is there's not a lonelier place than being the boss of a company, the being the leader. <laughs> so here you go. <laughs> and tired? Well, guess what? <laughs> self employed. Yay! <laughs> yeah. So here we are. We are working on it, isn't it? And I tick all the same boxes, by the way. Um, so yes, I run uh, two companies, and yeah. It, I'm I'm a sucker for punishment, but nowadays, or oh, at least I know um, what is going on, and I take measures yes. to be proactive, and that's what you did, and that's oh, I right. love to hear that. But what do you do when you get when you get a really strong urge? I, I mean, a real craving. How do you deal with that? So now, now, now I look at that craving, and I, I literally I look at it, and I'm. Tell it like, why are you here? <laughs> why, yeah. why are you like, yeah. why is that bugging? Why do I want to drink so bad right now? And, yeah. and, uh, and I could look at it now and be like, like, and I could literally tell it to shut up. <laughs> and I'm not, and I'm yeah. not joking. I'm not joking. It's like, um, I did this course with Dan Dapini and it's all about your mindset and yeah. your energy. So when that energy, when I'm thinking about that, I literally, sometimes I'll go like this, like I'm pulling it out of my head and I'm throwing it away. <laughs> oh, I'm like, Beautiful. get it out. <laughs> get it out. And, uh -huh. and it works for me. Uh -huh. I heard about that the technique. I tried to. Uh, I tried it, and it just no. It was not working for me. <laughs> but yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I have to do a little bit more work than just no. no focus on that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, no, it is what it is, though. But it only shows that there are a multitude of techniques that you can potentially learn or insights you can develop, um, and some of them will work for you at one stage in your life. But then you might move on and, and that's no longer working so well. So it's always so important to actually expose yourself to a multitude of skills, a multitude of insights that can help you um, when when life is not easy. And I think that is the, the key thing that I that I guess you are equally demonstrating in the way you live you live. You want to have yeah, free exits to every problem uh or every situation that you can find and if if deep breathing and meditation is fine brilliant great that you know it and i use it a lot but if i'm in the middle of a meeting well i can't just close my eyes and go <laughs> give me five minutes <laughs> so what do you do then or what do you do in a heated discussion um so you need to to learn ways so standard operating procedures that automatically kick in the moment you recognize this thing and in order to recognize it well you need to actually think about it and that's coming back full circle yes. to what you said you actually take time out in your day and actually just reflect and see what is happening because these are the times when you can then think about a problem lay down a new foundation that will help you in the future with a similar situation um, and that is so powerful. Oh, Kelly, wow, you're an amazing man. I'm so pleased for uh, for your transformation, for your for your willingness now to be so authentic and so to so so humble. I guess um, you are you're showing ownership uh, at a time when a lot of people seek scapegoats and seek external validation, blame others, um, to take ownership and to actually look at yourself first it seems to be a lost art, um, especially in a divisive society as yours in the United States. But then again, uh, we are not far behind here in New Zealand, and I bet you the same shit happens around the world. So therefore, wow. Oh, if people want to know more about you, uh, Kelly, if people want to to maybe link up with you and actually find, wow, okay, let's see how we can make, how can work together. Where can they find you? So I have my website at www.digkelco.com. And I have my social media accounts, which is Kelco Construction on Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been really focusing on building my, my personal brand, mm -hmm. which 
is about me. It's about my life, my decisions. So my my excavation company isn't a bunch of posts solely about moving dirt. It's about my growth <laughs> and my path <laughs> and and what I'm doing in my life to better myself. Uh, and um, and by doing that, I'm I'm really building my personal brand with it. So. I love it. But the amount of shit that we have done and ha shit that we have caused, you need a big excavator to actually dig through that crap. <laughs> I, I have one. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. 70,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I need to borrow that from my <laughs> for my <laughs> shit in the past. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, right. you're an amazing man. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. It was an honor to talk to you. Uh, you certainly made me reflect quite a bit on my own life. Life and quite a bit on, on uh, I guess, the steps that I can take today to strengthen my own resilience, just to the steps or the, the little the little habits I can strengthen and foster that allow me to consistently move forward rather than being pulled in maybe a direction that is not so productive. Now, you're an amazing man. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. Thank you for having me. Cool. And you guys out there, look after yourself and live with passion. Bye. I never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around.